The gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. It says, When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it was written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For the word of God in scripture, the word of God among us, and the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. John the Baptist is the one spoken of here, that John. He's been watching Jesus' ministry all along. Not only that, but he announced Jesus' ministry in its beginning, out in the wilderness, on the banks of the Jordan, while wearing the opposite of fine clothes, I should add. John invited people to turn from their fruitless way of life, to make a change, be baptized, and renew their connection to God. And crowds of people were coming out to see him. He baptized Jesus. He recognized Jesus' authority and power. He was there when the Spirit alit on Jesus in the river. The memory of this shared ritual must have been powerful. But then Jesus' ministry began, and John watched it happen. Jesus healed the sick restoring people back into community when their chronic and sometimes contagious diseases pushed them out of society, from being without stable resources for food or support or the joys of shared life together, Jesus restored people to wholeness. Jesus prayed. He lived with and for the poor. He ate meals with his disciples and started inviting people to gather together who were enemies. He seemed uninterested in whether he was breaking or following social rules. He was interested in healing and reconciliation. He taught the scriptures, and the information that he taught paired with what his life looked like started to become like a giant arrow pointing to his ministry, saying, this is what it looks like when God's people fulfill God's dream of a just and righteous communal life. And yet, the regional king had John the Baptist, who witnessed all of this and announced its coming, had John the Baptist arrested and imprisoned. The king had done something not good. He divorced his wife in order to marry his brother's wife. Not a good situation. Lots of other stuff he did that was real bad too. John condemned this, and he became a political prisoner. So I'm not going to summarize all of Jesus' ministry for you right now, but it's important for us to process what John the Baptist had seen and done by the time we reach the moment where he asks Jesus these questions. Miraculous signs of God's goodness are abounding, and they are for the most in need, and yet all is not restored. So John has to ask, are you the one? 
our hope and our salvation? One author writes, If Jesus is really the one who brings God's role to fruition, why is our world still marked by exploitation, injustice, polarization, and violence? Why are we still waiting? How long must we wait? Did Jesus really come to redeem those who suffer, or should we look for another? We have even more reason to be asking these questions than John did. If Jesus is really the one, why are we still waiting? The answer isn't academic. In this story, the answer is based on what we make of the signs that Jesus performs. Do we believe That when the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news proclaimed to them, that what we are seeing is God's power? Or are we looking for something else? In the month of December, there are a million thousand ways to get swept along into choices that have nothing to do with what you and your heart and soul are looking for. There are family gatherings and expectations and gifts that you're involved in. There are religious events and real service needs. The commercial world is very on board with all of the energy that goes into purchasing, so it's hard to leave the house without being solicited to buy more things than normal for the season. There's cooking and decorating and travel music, movies, and some very energetic outfits or cozy ones. It's the easiest time of year to detach from our center, the place that we both ask and answer. What are we looking for? Now, don't get me wrong. I am a huge fan of some of the things in that list that I just mentioned previously. Not not the bind, specifically not the bind. But for example, I will confess now publicly that I do have four trees in my house. <laughs> They're scattered around and it's tasteful, but it's, I do have four trees. So, I ordered a drink yesterday that came in this Santa mug and I was very thrilled about it. It was so cute. And somebody that was serving me had jingle bells on their sweater And I was a huge fan of that, too. But I wonder this morning, what are you looking for? What brings you here today? Is it to connect to love? Or to make a connection to your community? Is it to be comforted? Or to discover purpose in your life? What are you looking for in your heart when you're here or or not here? You all have real hurt that you carry. If you're alive and breathing, you do. Grief and trauma and unmet human needs. And you have longing, too. The thread carrying you towards your future. I have some passion in my voice about this this morning, because this week I spent some time with some fellow clergy, interfaith and Christian, and some members of the community who were being intimidated by a local white supremacist group. And I'm mad about this. This shouldn't be happening. Today I'm longing for an end to violent political and religious extremism. Now in the midst of it, There are people connecting across religions to support one another and show up for the most marginalized. But I would certainly prefer that this kind of brokenness didn't exist in the world at all. It's our deepest longings, whatever they are, that draw us to the heart of God. But sometimes all the information swirling around in the world distracts and blinds us a bit. Jesus often refers to this message of Isaiah that he's uh, referring to here in Matthew that I quoted about how the blind shall see and the lame shall walk and the sick shall be healed. 
And he means it literally, real physical healing in the body and real fixing of systems that drag people away from community when they need it most. Real embodied restoration. But he also means it metaphorically. We can become blinded in our minds and hearts a little bit or a lot sometimes. And we need help learning how to see again. Today we lit the candle of joy on the Advent wreath. And I'd like to invite us all to let our hearts notice what that joy is about and where it comes from. And I'd like to tell you that regardless of what it is that brought you here today, joy is what you'll find if you decide to participate in the story of healing and reconciliation that Jesus inaugurated so long ago. Jesus sends a message to John saying, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. These are signs of God's power that we should look for, that we should look for, and they are visible in the world around us. Again, these are physical healings of people in pain, and they are more than that. In first century Palestine, the physical ailments named here were considered contagious, whether or not they were, and were considered signs of sin. People who suffered in these ways were restricted from participating in normal community life. They, and the economically poor, did not have a social safety net set up by the political system for them. Not that that's all anyone needs. But not even that was available. The difference Jesus' healings made encompassed their whole lives. Restoration to social and religious life, not just release from pain. When people started listening to the good news that Jesus shared and then living it out themselves, their life together, their communal life together, became reflections of God's kingdom, where everyone had enough and nobody was poor, where everyone had a place and a purpose and nobody was left on the outside. How deep the healing goes is how deep joy is able to go for those who have gone through such trial and back again. Joy is what we will find if we are interested in connecting our life's purposes to these kinds of restoration in the name of Jesus. Christmas sweaters and Santa mugs are awesome, and they make me happy when I'm already feeling in a good mood. But joy comes from a deeper well, and it's accessible whether or not we're having a nice day. Deep joy is rooted in the knowledge that the love of God walks with you all the way through ailment out to the other side. And we can walk with each other on that road and discover the answer to our longings. I think that John the Baptist's question that he sent to Jesus was fair. And Jesus' answer makes it make sense. John, and perhaps we, thought that we were looking for an end to every difficult human reality. But what we see is actually the power of God working in the midst of them to heal and restore. If you are in grief, the Christmas season won't wipe it all away, but connection to true joy can run right alongside of it. If you are longing for peace in your heart, in your family, and in the world, the longing doesn't yet have reason to end, but there are signs of peace and restoration all around us. I thought of the lyrics in the final verse of O Come All Ye Faithful, a song of such great joy during this season. 
In it we sing, word of the Father now in flesh appearing. You know what that means? It means the promises of God for peace and justice and righteousness come to dwell among us in the flesh. That's what we celebrate when we sing these lines. Signs of joy all around. I thought too of the last verse of O Holy Night, which says, Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother. And in his name, all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. This song was translated into English in the mid-19th century and became popular among abolitionists. It sings of real embodied freedom for people enslaved. Next week is our lessons and carols service, and I want to encourage all of you to connect to the meaning of what you're singing. These songs aren't just beautiful and sweet, although they are that too, but they are about the deep joy that can only come from peace and justice. They remind us about what God has done and give us hope as we reflect on the promises about what God will do. The Reverend Mia McLean writes, the practice of remembering, of stringing the wondrous acts of God together is the practice of patient hope, of perseverance. It is a practice needed now more than ever. We remember not just to live in nostalgia and reminisce on the good old days. We remember as we call for a new revolution. This is what brings me joy today. And it is my prayer that it is the message that you all hear in the songs and stories of the Advent and Christmas season to come, that Jesus has come in flesh to start a revolution of peace and justice and righteousness. And now for this reason, I can't wait in just two short weeks to wish you all a Merry Christmas and celebrate his birth. Amen. <laughs>